These timbers are 22 feet long and they're set in the ground five feet, leaving 17 feet above ground. Now imagine, it's February 1864 and you are part of a 500 man group that's being brought through these doors right there and into this room you're being met by one man his name is Captain Henry Wirtz and he's a Confederate captain and this is Andersonville. This thing was on, wasn't it? I hope so. The Andersonville National Historic Site, located near Andersonville, Georgia, preserves the former Camp Sumter, also known as Andersonville Prison, a Confederate prison camp during the last 12 months of the Civil War. Most of the site lies in southwestern Macon County, adjacent to the east side of the town of Andersonville. As well as the former prison, the site contains the Andersonville National Cemetery and the National Prisoner of War Museum. The prison was built in February 1864 and served until April 1865. The site was commanded by Captain Henry Wirtz, who was tried and executed after the war for war crimes. It was overcrowded to four times its capacity with an inadequate water supply, inadequate food rations, and unsanitary conditions. Of the approximately 45,000 held at the camp during the war, nearly 13,000 died. We are just outside of Andersonville, Georgia. It's a little place uh, just sort of southwest of Macon, Georgia. And it is home to Camp Sumter. Not to be mistaken for Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter is in South Carolina. This is Camp Sumter and it's better known as Andersonville Prison. In January of 1864, construction was started on this 16 and a half acre phase one area of Andersonville prison to house Union troops that had been captured during the Civil War, POWs. Phase one area, which was 16 and a half acres, ran from this creek and then north up this hill and across this small plain. The south area on the other side of the creek is a 10 acre area that was built in June of 1864 as phase two. 
it was never planned initially to even be there. Phase one was designed to house 10,000 troops. And by August of 1864, they already had 33,000. This is the south corner, southwest corner of the stockade. And if you'll look down this line to your left along the road line there, that's the stockade wall, those little white posts. To the right, 15 feet away, you'll see the white post indicating what's called the deadline. The deadline was a horse rail that ran 15 feet inside the stockade wall for the whole perimeter. If a prisoner even as much as reached across the deadline, he was shot by one of the guards that was placed in the guard shacks that were on top of the wall every 90 feet. Andersonville Prison was frequently undersupplied with food. By 1864, not only civilians living within the Confederacy, but also the soldiers of the Confederacy itself were struggling to obtain sufficient quantities of food. The shortage of fare was suffered by prisoners and Confederate personnel alike within the fort, but the prisoners received less than the guards, who unlike their captives, did not become severely emaciated or suffer from scurvy. The latter was likely a major cause of the camp's high mortality rate, as well as dysentery and diarrhea, which were the result of filthy living conditions and poor sanitation. The only source of drinking water originated from a creek, which also served as the camp's latrine, which was filled at all times with fecal matter from thousands of sick and dying men. Behind me is the Star Fort. It was southwest corner of the stockade overlooking the whole area. This is where the headquarters and hospitals were for the prison. They also had cannons. Four of them were facing outward to ward off any raiding Union troops other five were facing the north slope of the prison. I'm standing on the north side of the compound. That post is the stockade wall and this post is the deadline. If you'll notice behind me, the slope heading south and then it goes crest and goes down and then it comes back up. The stockade wall on the other side, you can't even see it because it's below the, the crest line for the northern hill here. Now, imagine 35,000 troops inside that small area with water that's coming from a stream that's been blocked and causing diseases. To make matters worse, the camp was being built in January and by February, the first 500 troops were being brought here to house as prisoners. That meant only the walls and the commander's area was constructed. There were no shelters and the soldiers had to make whatever shelter they could out of whatever they had. A lot of times it was leftover lumber, logs and sticks, and whatever blankets or um, tarps that they might have had with them at the time. 
Those things were not taken from them when they were taken prisoner. The prison, which opened in February of 1864, before it was completed, originally covered about 16 and a half acres. And in June of that same year, it was enlarged to 26 and a half acres. Originally designed to house 10,000 Union prisoners, by August of 1864, just a mere seven months after receiving its first 500 prisoners, Camp Sumter already had 33,000. That's three times the capacity it was constructed for. By the end of its use in April of 1865, it housed 45,000 troops. And with its mortality rate of 13,000 men, it has been deemed the deadliest POW camp in U.S. history. However, you can't talk about Camp Sumter without looking at its commander, Captain Henry Wirtz. Born in Switzerland in 1822, Wirtz emigrated to the U.S in 1849 and attempted to be a physician in New York. Having failed in that venture, he then moved to Connecticut and then Massachusetts and then Kentucky, taking jobs like translator, homeopathic physician. He finally settled in Louisiana on a plantation where he got his first experience controlling large numbers of people. When the Civil War broke out, Wirtz joined the 4th Battalion of Louisiana, and after Bull Run, the unit was transferred to Richmond, where Wirtz was assigned as a guard in the Howard's Factory POW prison. He quickly set upon organizing the prisoners and gained a reputation of being efficient yet callous. It was here that Wirtz drew the attention of General John Winder. Winder, seeing Wirtz's potential, soon began to assign him out to different tasks. Ones that brought Wirtz a certain amount of Confederate notoriety within the field of POW camp organizations. Wirtz was known to be inconsistent, however, when it came to the treatment of POWs. He would one day be cordial and even jovial with prisoners and then be cursing them the next day. He often used threats to keep them in line, but would also petition on their behalf for supplies and comforts. He was promoted to captain while he was stationed in Tuscaloosa, Alabama and replaced Captain Griswold when he was transferred. In late spring of 1862, when the prisoners in Tuscaloosa were removed for a prison ex prisoner exchange, Wirtz was transferred back to Richmond, where his talents were used in numerous positions, but none were as fitting for him as managing prisoners. It's sometime during this period that he sustained a wound to his right arm that would never heal to his dying day. Due to his wound, he took several months furlough in an attempt to seek medical treatment. Upon his return in 1864, General Winder assigned him to a new POW camp. This camp was in a little known area far from the combat lines, Andersonville, Georgia, in Camp Sumter. There was trouble at Camp Sumter before Wirtz ever even arrived. The camp was where construction started in January 1864 was already receiving prisoners by February before the construction was even complete. And when Wirtz arrived, the command structure was in disarray. When Wirtz arrived in March of 1864, he had a letter for the post commander, Colonel Alexander Parsons of the 55th Georgia Infantry. Wirtz was to be given command of the interior portion of the prison. Complicating this issue, the Confederate government also sent Captain Griswold to take command of the stockade at the same time. This issue was soon taken care of and Wirtz assumed command. He immediately took task organizing the prison. He ordered a deadline to be constructed and with it a strict order not to let it be breached under any exception. And daily headcounts. 
He was also continually frustrated with unclear lines of responsibility. It seemed that every different aspect of the camp had their own command structure. He could request rations or guards, but that didn't mean that their respective commands on post would give them, seeing he had no authority to require them. His correspondence with his command in Richmond often indicated his frustration with the situation at hand. So in the summer of 1864, General Winder made a visit to Camp Sumter, but having no clear command directive, his visit only complicated matters worse. Now Wirtz began to show his inconsistency with the treatment of prisoners again. He would be helpful and compassionate one day and horrendous the next. It was this inconsistency that would lead him to the gallows. Wirtz was arrested by Union troops on May 7, 1865 and was taken to Washington, D.C. under disguise and placed on trial for conspiracy to kill or injure prisoners in violation of laws of war. He was also charged with multiple counts of murder. A few of these murder charges accused Wirtz of personally killing prisoners, but most stemmed from orders that he gave to others. His trial received national attention as the country demanded justice for the deaths of 13,000 American soldiers. Far more soldiers died in captivity at Andersonville than at any battlefield, a fact that was not lost on former prisoners or the Northern public. Wirtz's attorney argued that he did all he could given the difficult circumstance. The shortage of supplies and medical care were beyond Wirtz's authority and dozens of letters documenting Wirtz's efforts to solve the logistical problems. However, Captain Griswold testified that Wirtz had indeed violated the laws of war by not only withholding available food and supplies, but also by issuing orders that directly resulted in the death of prisoners of war. One of the great paradoxes of the Wirtz trial is that both prosecution and defense sought to prove that Wirtz was following orders. The prosecutors hoped to convict higher ranking Confederate officials and Wirtz hoped to absolve himself by passing responsibility up the chain of command. As in nearly every military tribunal, the following orders defense did not work. Wirtz could blame the poor logistics and overcrowding on his superiors but he could not escape his own orders and actions and was convicted of conspiracy and murder. He was hanged on November 10, 1865 and was eventually buried in the Mount Olive Cemetery in Washington, D.C. So many men fell sick and died here at Andersonville that within just a few months, they were dying at the rate of 100 a day. To begin with, they were burying them individually here in the cemetery, just about a quarter of a mile northeast, I mean northwest of the compound. But eventually they started having to bury them in mass graves unmarked. Each grave here has a number on it. And the reason for that is due to one young man and one young lady in 1865. 19-year-old Dorrance Atwater, 2nd New York Cavalry, was captured in July 1863. He spent eight months in Richmond, Virginia prisons before arriving at Andersonville. In June of 1864, he was detailed to work in the hospital where he recorded the names and grave locations of the deceased. He secretly copied this list and smuggled it out when he was released. After the war, he asked the War Department to publish the list, but they refused. Then he met Clara Barton a battlefield nurse 
who was looking for missing soldiers. She was eager to help. Barton accompanied Dorrance and the U.S. Army Quartermaster Expedition to Andersonville to mark the graves of the dead. Atwater's death register, published in 1866, enabled many families to locate their loved ones. Thanks to his work, over 95% of the graves were identified. In 1869, Clara Barton traveled to Geneva, Switzerland as a member of the International Red Cross. In 1880, the American Red Cross was established, the culmination of a decade of work by Barton. She served as the organization's first president until 1904. Thank you for coming to Keeping History on Two Wheels. If you like this video, please hit the subscribe button. It's right over here and it's the red one. Don't forget to hit that bell so that you'll know when we do an upload each and every week. Remember, every trip starts with a step, and that step, well, it starts with you.